treachery in Beatdown City is a bit difficult to describe. At first blush, it's basically River City Ransom, a beat-em-up game where you just punch an endless swarm of goons. And that's not untrue? But its combat is substantially more complicated than that, as evidenced by the fact that the game opens with a winners don't mash buttons warning a la the dare screens that were ubiquitous in arcades in the 90s. In its attempt to make beat em up combat less mashy and more engaging, Treachery in Beatdown City introduces a bunch of mechanics from modern JRPGs and action titles. It's not turn based, really, but you need to use action points to throw punches and kicks, and those take time to regenerate, which leads to a back and forth between you and your enemies. The more action points you have stored up, the more elaborate combos you can form, so there's value in banking them until the bar is full and you can unleash the most damage. But using items or countering enemy moves also uses action points, so there's a danger of over-leveraging yourself if you're not careful. Additionally, to use special moves, you need to use fighting points, which are effectively a kind of mana. They're gained over time by throwing standard punches, restoring action points, or having a sufficiently long combo. The gameplay ends up being a half-brawler, half-modern JRPG-ish fight system hybrid with three fighters to choose from that each have their own specialties. Lisa is a boxer capable with both combos and grappling, Bruce specializes in targeted blows and combos but has limited grapple abilities, and Brad is a burly wrestler who has tons of great grapple moves but struggles with punches and kicks. Kickstarted back in 2014, and yes, full transparency, I was a backer back then, Treachery in Beatdown City has been in development for at least six years and it shows the signs of its gestation time, both in the sense that the end product feels really solid and polished, and also in the sense that it kind of feels like it got teleported here from late in the Obama administration. The game's plot is basically that of every beat-em-up ever. Ninjas kidnap the president, and our plucky heroes need to beat up a bunch of goons to save them. But here, the kidnapped president what must be saved from ninjas is one Blake Orama, and the villainous mayor of Beatdown City is a billionaire named Mike Moneybags. Again, you get the sense that a lot of this was laid into the framework and DNA of the game circa 2014. But that's largely the extent of the game's on-the-nose political references. The remainder of the game is largely our three protagonists beating up every flavor of obnoxious, odious, and often passively racist New Yorker that they run into on the streets. There are cops that think brutality is part of being a public servant, gratingly abrasive couples who only stop fighting each other to share their hatred for everyone else, and people who Instagram every meal they have mixed in with genre staples like biker gangs and ninjas. There's even a game design teacher you beat up, which, I mean... Yeah, it's, it's great. It feels like the developers had a laundry list of every annoying encounter they've ever had and wanted to use this game as an outlet. And it's surprisingly fun to beat up people who aren't mustache twirlingly evil, but simply the worst kinds of people you run into on the street every day. And the attempts to bring depth to the beat em up genre largely succeed. The three protagonists feel very different to play as. Brad's emphasis on the grapple system forces you to tank a lot of damage as you wait to get enough action points to really be effective. And Bruce's jabs and combos have a real get in, get out sense about them. Meanwhile, Lisa feels a bit more improvisational. The game has other small mechanical twists too, like how damage from behind an enemy is a critical hit, giving you incentive to try to sneak behind enemies where possible, or leading to moves like Brad's ability to circle behind someone once they've been grappled for extra damage. It's not the most complicated, elaborate combat system ever devised, but it's certainly several steps up from River City Ransom and managed to force me to think about how I was going to go about slinging punches. So if nothing else, I think it achieved its core aims. If I had one complaint, it's that the high-level game is a bit... flat. Combat is quite satisfying and forces you to think strategically, but with little downtime between fights, nothing else to do in the overworld map but move to the next fight, and a ton of fights in each area, it can start to feel a smidge... grindy. Not entirely, mind you. The fact that you have three fighters with very distinct styles and that you need to keep rotating between them helps, as does the fairly extensive enemy roster. And add to that different combinations of enemies, boss fights, personal encounters that force you to play as a specific character to unlock new abilities, and mechanical twists like weapons and revenge moves that the game continues to drop as you play, and Treachery in Beatdown City is always trying to mix up its fights and deepen its strategy. But it's not nearly as plot-driven as something like Friends of Ringo Ishikawa, and there's really not much in the way of a high-level gameplay loop or exploration or level-wide strategy. 
Street fights cast against various city backdrops, and some funny tongue-in-cheek dialogue at the expense of its goofy goons is all the game's got. And while it's enjoyable, it can get samey. But if my biggest complaint here is also my biggest complaint about Doom 2016, then you're probably doing something right. I imagine the audience for Treachery and Beatdown City might be kind of niche. It's for fans that want to revisit a more advanced River City Ransom, but not as a blown up modern AAA game, which would be, I don't know, Sleeping Dogs, but as a game that could conceivably have existed on the NES, just with way more mechanical depth, all packaged as a comedy title lampooning the more unsavory types of people that make life irritating and then getting to beat them up. It's funny, it's got a distinctive voice and point of view when it comes to its commentary, and it takes a genre known for being pretty gosh dang shallow and makes it feel strategic and engaging, which is an impressive feat. If that sounds like your kind of jam, check it out. Speaking of games that are just a hair out of their political relevance, remember the vote to acquit Trump? That was only in February. The last 35 years that have been March and April sure have been a thing, huh? Anyways, released in January of this year by Some Hominid Games, Is the President a Traitor is a hidden identity game for people that always wanted to be this guy. Or this guy. Or work for this guy. You play as an investigator in the FBI, or some intelligence organization, it's not exactly clear which, assigned to investigate possible treason by the President of the United States of America by two cigarette-smoking man types. You do so by surveilling targets, finding people of interest, and building a case against them. You use three key resources to do this. Money, intel, and evidence. Money is obvious. Everything you do costs cash, whether it's tailing a suspect, tapping the president's communications, or putting out propaganda to counteract the president's damaging behavior. Intelligence is the abstract representation of the information that lets you act. With intelligence, you could better determine how to bribe someone, or what locations to search for their secret documents, and can be leveraged to sway the game board as an alternative to money in a lot of scenarios. And evidence is the most precious resource. It's what lets you actually prosecute and ultimately jail conspirators, including the president, him or herself. So the whole game is basically using money to gather intelligence on, and complete profiles on, individuals that will then let you gather evidence that you can use to prosecute them. To be clear, this is very abstracted, and legal and investigative professionals really shouldn't be looking for something representational of reality here. This game is not an exploration of actual prosecution or detective work. If you couldn't tell by the art style, it's way more of a conspiracy thriller. But if you've ever wanted to live out the dream of piecing together the crime of the century and who's in on it, your ship has finally come in. There are even Deep Throat style covert factions who can offer recordings and documents that you can turn into either evidence or intelligence, but beware, not all of them are altruistic, and you don't want to meet them in a back alley unarmed if you can help it. Getting shot by one of them is absolutely a way you can lose the game, and I have. Even more interestingly, the two cigarette-smoking man characters that serve as your bosses can feed you leads to these organizations, and you might want to cross-check the backstories of how they met, because it's entirely possible that one of your bosses is also in on it. Trust no one. While I love the game's conspiracy thriller vibe and acid pixel aesthetic, the politics of the whole thing are very... how do I want to say this... left-leaning, but also very hashtag resistance-y? For example, the game opens with your two bosses interrogating you, including asking if you're a patriot. If you say no, the game dumps you back to the title screen. There's no room for dissension in the ranks when we're fighting for the heart of the nation, I guess. But it's more than just that little false choice. Your main health indicator during the game is the faith in the institution of governance itself, which you need to put out propaganda campaigns to repair, while the president actively tries to ruin it with scandals and controversial statements. All the while, a news ticker pops up every few in-game days with breaking news ripped from the headlines that are only a smidge more goofy than the real thing. And while I've only played like three games of it, so I can't be certain they're all like this, most of the conspiracies I started to unravel involved corruption coming in from abroad. And I get that that's kind of how treason works, and I know that the lone agent fighting to save the system is a conspiracy thriller trope, and I know the game opens with a quote about the biggest threat coming from within, but... 
The whole game sort of operates from this idea that the concept and systems of America are fundamentally good. It's this invasive outside force of corruption coming in from elsewhere that's poisoning the system through bad actors that just needs to be fixed for everything to be good and just again. Is the President a Traitor is a game that it sometimes feels like it's a justly outraged expression of frustration at the state of current American politics, with the corruption at its core being a manifestation of greater social decay, as hinted at with those news stories. And other times feels like a game that is ready to call anyone that disagrees with it a Russian bot and had really pinned all of its hopes on Robert Mueller. And that's not bad per se, but it does feel weird. Still, politics aside, I feel like the conspiracy thriller setting is a perfect match for the hidden identity game mechanics, and I can't deny that the little procedurally generated characters, backstories, and personalities help make the game feel a little bit more personal. I will never forgive President Ron May for his successful pardoning of Helen Wallace after I worked so hard to uncover her crimes and bring her to justice. The only fish that got away in a run that ultimately sunk the president's corrupt administration. And that's my one regret as a federal prosecutor. I've seen Steam reviews that refer to the proc gen characters as fluff, and certainly it's possible to min-max your way through the game without reading names or personality traits or biographies, looking only at the corruption versus loyalty stats and intel levels and abstracting it down to whatever you just need to do to win, but I think that's way less fun. It's far more engaging to actually connect the dots and picture the real conspiracy that the game is trying to tell, to mentally catalog the crimes of President May, to get lobbyist Joyce Fisher to flip because her comfortable lifestyle was threatened with prison time, and then using the information you gleaned from that to start taking down the president's cabinet and successfully convict him. The whole game is played through menus and dialogue screens, and it's real easy to feel like it's cold and distant. So you're either willing to meet the game halfway and engage in the story it's trying to tell through those menus, or not. And I think that's a big determining factor in whether or not people like playing this game. Really, I'd recommend it to anyone who's into an intersection of political scandals, conspiracy thrillers, or hidden identity games. It's not that long. If you manage to beat it, it's only two to three hours, and I haven't seen a ton of variation from the procedural storytelling that really compel me to keep doing it again. But it scratched not just an itch to do the cork board and red string thing, but to see justice prevail. In the world of 2020, a conspiracy thriller that unravels an institution-destroying presidential scandal, where they actually managed to pay for it in the end, may be little more than a fantasy, but it's certainly a comforting one to engage in. I'm gonna confess, I'm pretty much a novice to deck building games. I know that Slay the Spire is kind of the gold standard in the genre, but while I've played it a few times, it never really hooked me. My first real entry into how great these games could be was Terry Kavanaugh's Dicey Dungeons, which is fantastic, but attempts to pare back a lot of the excesses of Slay the Spire's card decks with an emphasis on simple, readable mechanics driven by dice rolls and short, delicately balanced sojourns into 20 minute dungeons that mix and remix established mechanics. So while it's amazing, and Chipsell's soundtrack is amazing, it's not really representative of what a lot of people love about deck builders typical of the form. So because I'm no expert, it may be worth taking my opinion with a grain of salt here, but I've really enjoyed my time with Massive Galaxy Studios for the warp. Maybe it's just because I'm more of a sci-fi nerd than a fantasy geek, but there's something about taking the deck builder experience and merging it with space combat tropes that really works for me. For the Warp skews way closer to Slay the Spire than it does to Dicey Dungeon's more clean, low-level formalism, but it's also got enough unique things going on mechanically, as well as the trappings of the setting, which again is kind of what hooked me, that it doesn't feel too, too much like Slay the Spire but with spaceships. The setup is straightforward. You're the captain of a ship carrying a MacGuffin of value. Maybe illegal, maybe not, when the Warp Gate home collapsed. Now you have to take the long way back, which requires passing through some less than friendly areas of space that aren't entirely controlled by the Pan-Human Alliance. You set off towards the nearest gate, bumping into hostile alien ships, friendly space stations, colonized worlds, alien ruins, friendly space truckers, and more. The main force limiting your exploration is fuel. You start with only so much, and while you can buy some from space stations you may encounter, and win some from combat, it's scarce enough that you always want to be heading towards the next warp gate where a boss is inevitably waiting. Manage to get to all five warp gates and defeat all five warp gate bosses, and you and your crew just might make it to your fence for your big payday. Now, For the Warp is in early access, and it definitely feels it. You can beat the main campaign once you know what you're doing fairly trivially, which says it unlocks a hardcore mode that isn't implemented yet, and there's a few minor balance issues and just a general dearth of content. There's an encyclopedia that doesn't seem to do anything yet, for example, and with only five sectors and only but so many cards, it lacks the mechanical breadth of something like Dicey Dungeons and the content breadth of something like Slay the Spire. But what's here is really promising, and they've been actively updating it in the month or so I've been playing it. 
There are currently three ships, an all-arounder, a defense-heavy ship that focuses on shield management but has a weaker hull underneath it, and a carrier ship that specializes in using drones you send out to automatically fire at the enemy at the start of each turn, while you focus on mitigating incoming damage and managing enemy statuses. And it all happens through these sci-fi tropes that are played broadly enough that you can kind of imagine what the space battles look like in your head. Having to manage a limited amount of energy each turn to simultaneously maintain shields yet effectively release offensive volleys feels like every Star Trek battle you've ever seen. And the cards that let you tweak the amount of energy you have, or get free damage and or free shields, feel like those engineering hacks that the crew always comes up with. You can deploy cloaking mechanisms to reduce damage, or yes, do a barrel roll to avoid damage for a turn, use moves that can panic enemy crew into a different behavior for the next turn, or unleash precision strikes that do very little damage but can disable a ship that's been sufficiently beat up for the next turn. I kind of fell in love with For the Warp when I bested the boss ship on level two with my whole critical and a single health point left for almost the entire match. And being able to do things like bribe the two guard ships a boss had called in to assist it, way simplifying the fight, is just very much the sort of rugged, amoral space pirate thing that makes me enjoy this a lot more than a sword and sorcery title. There's even an encounter with an enemy ship with huge shields and massive health that isn't a boss, it's an alien race testing you. If you manage to survive long enough, thus proving your worth, it'll disengage. I love the crunchy pixel art that doesn't lean too hard on a retro sensibility and lets them capture some really neat looking space scenes, from planets looming in the background of a battle to your tiny ship approaching an alien temple for some risky archaeology. It's still early in development, light on content, and it's not the most earth-shattering deck builder in existence. But it's solid, and as a fan of things like Firefly and Cowboy Bebop or just space pirates and cosmic freelancers in general, I can't wait to see how it develops, and I'm hoping it blossoms into something really cool. Ian Livingstone's Death Trap Dungeon has a weirdly long, storied history. The original was a game book released in 1984. A game book, for those who are fully of the digital age, is exactly what it sounds like, a book that comes with its own systems and rule sets for reading it. It's a set of books that would include choose-your-own-adventure titles, but also books with more complex systems than simple go-to-this-page style choices. In Death Trap, you got to make traditional do-you-go-left or do-you-go-right and do-you-open-the-door or do-you-carry-on narrative choices, but you also got to engage in some light dice-rolling combat. The premise of the book is kind of tropey at this point, but it helps move things straight into the action. A rich madman built a maze of death and terrors and every year holds a contest to see who, if anyone, can reach the end and claim its treasures. The book was popular enough, and the setting enticingly game-like enough, that it was adapted into a third-person action game in the 90s. It has very little in common with the book, other than being a game where you go into a dungeon in hopes of coming out the other side. It also has not aged very well. It throws out the decision-making and dice-based role-playing for some very, very early very rough 3D platforming in combat, and the result is more or less what you would expect from this era of high fantasy 3D titles. But that wasn't the end for Death Trap Dungeon. It was adapted to the D20 game system in 2003 in a Dungeon Master's Guide wholly separate from the original game book, in case you wanted to play Dungeons & Dragons Death Trap Dungeon. Alliteration is fun. The entire trilogy of Ian Livingstone's Death Trap gamebooks was then adapted by Nomad Games as a top-down role-playing game in 2018. This hues much, much closer to the book. You go through more or less the same decisions, and they have more or less the same outcomes. There are some flourishes here and there that couldn't be done in the book. You have an experience system that allows you to upgrade your dice by completing quests and felling enemies, for example. And there are some minor deviations in the path, but it's a reasonably faithful retelling as a top-down experience. But while seeing Sukumvit's dungeon from the top down may be visually arresting, it also sort of squashes things down. The florid language that described this hellish abyss becomes a series of compressed bitmaps. Your choices boil down to icons. 
It's not a bad adaptation of the book, and again, it's actually an adaptation of three whole books, each with their own unique settings and game systems, so if you're interested in the other ones, maybe check those out. But by being so literal, it flattens what feels like a grand adventure when read aloud. It's hard for top-down graphics to capture the majesty of a high fantasy setting. Fortunately, if you want a video game adaptation that does manage to capture the sensation of reading an adventure game book, I have the game for you. On the 1st of May, each year, warriors and heroes come to Fang to face the test of their lives. Survival is unlikely, yet many take the risk, for the prize is great. A purse of 10,000 gold pieces and the freedom of Chiang Mai forever. Released in January of this year, it's Death Trap Dungeon, the interactive video adventure. And honestly, I've never played anything quite like it. It is an extremely literal adaptation of Ian Livingstone's book as read by English actor Eddie Marzan, who you may remember as the headmaster in Deadpool 2 or Inspector Lestrade in the Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movies. The game is pretty much entirely full motion video, but it's not really an FMV game. Marzan isn't your protagonist, he's just straight up reading you the game book and asking you to make choices. Carefully checking the floor for any more hidden traps. You see that the goblet contains a sparkling red liquid. If anything, it creates this sort of parasocial equivalent of playing with a dungeon master. Marzan reads from the text, and sometimes illustrations straight from the book appear on the screen. There is a large idol in the center of the cabin that must be six meters high. In its head are jeweled eyes, each as big as your fist. The result is something that feels more literary and engages your imagination more. Like, compare this scene with a pile of worms, one spoken and one rendered on the screen. Peering warily into the pit, you are disgusted to see a mass of pale, writhing worms, some as much as half a meter long. Nauseated, you are about to turn away when you notice that their undulating bodies are swarming around a dagger, its point held fast in a crack in the pit floor. The hilt is cased in black leather, studded with opals, and the blade is fashioned from a strange, reddish-black burnished metal you have never seen before. You long to touch the dagger, but this would mean plunging your hand in among the writhing worm. See? There's something about it being actually rendered that just feels... Smaller, right? When you hear Marzan read it, you envision this golden dagger surrounded by a sea of worms in your mind's eye, and in the game it's a few pixels stuck in a wiggling puddle. That's not to say either version is bad, just that they're different. For example, the FMV game is so literal that there are a lot of instant deaths from choosing the wrong choice. The gas knocks you out and you fall backwards, bouncing down the idol to land on the stone floor. Your adventure ends. That doesn't happen so much in the top-down game, and it even gives you a lot of extra lives to let you keep making progress with your existing inventory if you want. You just restart at the cave entrance and retrace your steps. The FMV game lets you revisit scenes too, but it's more unwinding what you've already done rather than having a life system. Which one is better really depends on what you're going for. An FMV game that's more literary but comes with all the cruel game design ideology of 1980s fantasy role-playing, or a game with more modern sensibilities but that takes a sprawling magical world and turns it into a series of mostly static small sprites that just sort of compresses everything. Both are good in their own way, and I'd recommend each of them. But also, I think it's just absolutely fascinating to have very literal adaptations of a book that we can compare directly, scene for scene. Not to mention the fact that a game book released in 1984 is still having what are effectively ports made to this day. The whole thing is just endlessly fascinating to me, and if 1980s role-playing, parasocial Dungeons and Dragons, or choose-your-own-adventure games are up your alley, I'd recommend checking all of this stuff out. Except the 90s game. Don't, don't check that out. That's bad. <laughs>